Uh, welcome to another in our uh, series of ongoing uh, Free State Foundation programs. I'm Randy May, president of the Free State Foundation, and uh, I'm pleased that uh, you're here, all of you. It's, a, it's another great crowd, and uh, we're excited about that and appreciate it. Uh, we've titled this program Ideas for Communications Law and Policy Reform uh, for 1913. Uh, but don't get me wrong, uh, and that, inc that includes Commissioner uh, McDowell over here. I'm sure uh, it would be good to get some of the ideas that we're going to talk about today uh, implemented sooner rather than later. So if we happen to be able to do, do anything in the rest of 2012, uh, that would be good. I don't want to write, I don't want to write anything off uh, here. Uh, now, speaking of good ideas, uh, before I introduce today's program, I want to point out uh, that next Monday is the publication date for the Free State Foundation's newest book. Uh, it's called Communications, Law, and Policy in the Digital Age, the Next Five Years. It's published by Carolina Academic Press, and hopefully you picked up a flyer for the new book when you signed in. Uh, they were out at the front, front registration table. Now, the book contains a lot of good ideas for reforming communications policy, whether by the FCC itself or by virtue of a new communications act on subjects ranging from broadband regulation, spectrum policy and incentive auctions, universal service reform, and public media reform. In addition to myself and FSF's own Seth Cooper, the authors uh, included in the book include uh, Representative Marsha Blackburn, uh, Jim Spada, Christopher Yu, Bruce Owen, Ellen Goodman, Michelle Connolly, and Daniel Lyons. All of the those authors except uh, Congressman uh, Blackburn are uh, Free State Foundation members of Free State Foundation's uh, Board of Academic uh, Advisors, and, and we're very proud of them. Now, some of these essays in the book are following works derived from the remarks delivered by the contributors last October at the Free State Foundation's uh, then fifth anniversary celebration. And the reason I mentioned that flyer is at the bottom of the flyer there's a special discount code uh, from Carolina Academic Press so that if you order the book using that discount code then you get 20% off the uh, price of the book. Uh, so, back to today's program. I think if you follow communications policy at all, and I know virtually everyone in this room does, and if you follow the work of the Free State Foundation, then the rationale for today's program is pretty obvious from its title. It doesn't need much elaboration. So I'll simply put it this way to provide a backdrop for our discussion. Many people, including those with much expertise and experience, believe that giving, given the competition and market dynamism that now exist in various communications market segments, there is still way too much legacy regulation uh, on the books. And that's not to mention the fact that new regulations are still being proposed and adopted, such as net neutrality and data roaming mandates and new regulations on video providers and so forth. So this, this is key. Here's the key. If it's true that there is more regulation than necessary to protect consumers, this matters. Overregulation has consequences for investment and innovation, for consumer welfare, and for our overall economy. If this is true, then what we want to do today is have a good discussion about ideas about things that can be done uh, either at the Commission or if necessary through Congress. So our pro program today is going to be broken into two parts. First, to set the stage, I'm going to have a conversation with F FCC uh, Commissioner Robert McDowell, and I'm sure uh, Commissioner McDowell is going to put uh, some good ideas on the, the table, and along the way, uh, I'm also sure that, that his, our discussion will provide some good fodder for the uh, second part of the program, a discussion by our panel of very esteemed experts. Uh, we're going to take some questions uh, and even brief 
comments, if you, if you have ideas, notice I said brief, at the end of each of the two parts. So please have that, that in mind as we proceed. Now, our Twitter handle for the conference is uh, the pound sign FSF October 18 Ideas Forum. Uh, it's near the top of that uh, first page on your speaker's bio. Uh, now, Baron Sotza told me, I think he could be right, that that, that Twitter handle is, is uh, uh, long. But, uh, you know, my response is there are a lot of bright people in this room here, a lot of very bright people. I'm sure you can handle that Twitter handle. So I hope you'll, uh, I hope you'll tweet away uh, during and also after the conference. I, I'm going to check that to see whether the ideas keep rolling in. So uh, first I want to welcome Commissioner McDowell. Uh, why don't you go ahead and you welcome him. I'm going to walk over there and get mic'd up. Uh, Okay, you're all set, and uh, I think we're uh, ready to go. Well, thanks, first of all, for, for coming. I appreciate it. Uh, you see you uh, obviously helped us draw a capacity crowd here today. Uh, now, can everyone, everyone hear? Oh, good. Okay, well, you and I had a conversation uh, similar to this actually back on February 4th, I think it was, 2011. Uh, Seems so like yesterday. Yes. So uh, <laughs> it's probably emblazoned in your memory, right? Uh, but just in case it's not, I've got the transcript right down here <laughs> at my feet. Thank I'll, you, Candy. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> see, he's good. He's all, we, this is the way it was last time. Uh, he's very good. Okay, now you had the same job back then when we did that. And of course, you were with us back in May when we. Uh, we're talking about the WIC upcoming Wicket uh, conference, and uh, you know I introduced you uh, then and went through a lot of your a lot of your bio. But but this time uh, you're still an FCC commissioner. Nothing. There's anything else changed in your life that we ought to know about uh, before we get started? <laughs> Not unless the Senate Not has impeached me since uh, this morning. Are we good, Senate staffers? No impeachment. Okay, good. So yeah, no, I think you were confirmed unanimously, if I remember correctly, but. But anyway, so I'm not going to go through all the, the uh, uh, stuff on the bio, but it's all there, and that's true for all of our speakers um, uh, when we get to the uh, panel. Uh, now, uh, but one thing I always have done every time that we've been privileged to have you with us is point out that both you and I <laughs> did attend very good undergraduate schools, right? At least good basketball, at least a good basketball school. Uh, together. Uh, I noticed that you said you got, uh, you uh, having something published by the Carolina Press. It's in Durham, North Carolina, though. It's, a Carol it's called the Carolina Academic Press, but it's not the University of North Carolina oh, okay, Press. It's, it's, <laughs> in fact, it's located a few blocks from the Duke campus. Perfect. Just to share. Very good. Just check. Uh, okay. Uh, now, so back in February of uh, 2011, um, when uh, we were doing our uh, conversation uh, then, uh, Blair Levin happened to be sitting in front of us, and I said, I can foresee scenarios where you would be chairman before Blair gets to be chairman. And you didn't respond at all then. Uh, I'm, I'll just re repeat that. Do you have any response you want to make at this time? Was that the same conference where Blair compared me to Karl Marx? <laughs> <laughs> it might have been. So we'll move, we'll Why move don't we on. Why do we move on from that? Yeah. We'll move on yeah. from there. Okay, so we're going to jump in and talk about reforming uh, communications policy, looking at, uh, of course, what the FCC can do itself. I'm particularly interested in that, but <clears throat> I understand that that. Uh, 
you're bound by the statute, of course, in certain ways. And so I'm interested, too, in what um, <clears throat> Congress uh, ought to do, and, and maybe towards the end we'll even talk about that in a macro sense, about what a new, new act would uh, look like. <clears throat> but let's start by focusing just for a moment on two, a moment or two on what I would call the the administrative or, or the more pure process uh, types of uh, uh, issues. Uh, and, and I remember, I recall that, I think this was in the summer of 2009 when, when Chairman Janikowski uh, first came on board, actually I think before he even had a chance to unpack his bags, you sent him that six-page letter with, uh, with uh, some of your ideas about uh, reform. Uh, some of your reform ideas, uh, and uh, I remember there were some good ideas there, and I don't I don't want to rehash all those things. I don't want to go through them in detail, but you know I know that uh, you did send that letter, and it's now got it's three three years later. Uh, just talk to us a bit about whether uh, in the main uh, some of those things were done or what what remains to be done or what could be done from a, a process uh, viewpoint in terms of how the Commission operates and functions that still ought to be done? Excellent question. Very open-ended. Uh, and first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, it's great to be here. And had I known you were going to have such a large and distinguished audience, I would have prepared better for this. Uh, but uh, We always I'll just, do. I'll uh, just open my mouth and see what falls out. Um, and so, you know, in that regard, I just want you know, members of the press to know that hopefully I'm not going to say anything new or controversial, so you can just put down your pens and turn off your tape recorders. But uh, um, so we're ruminating here. But on your 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 first question, and and to the people in the cheap seats, like Jim Castle, good good to see you. I'll lean over this way every now and then so you can see me from around the column. Um, did you get a discount for the obstructed view ticket? Uh, no? okay. um, so uh, I'd sent. Uh, uh, Chairman Mike Copps, a similar letter in early, in January of 09, and then uh, updated it to, to send uh, a new one to, to Julius in, in the summer of, uh, I think it was July of 2009. Um, and just at that point, sort of based on my three and a half years at that point at the commission, there was a lot we learned. Uh, one of the things I'd suggested was, which was to do a sort of a, an audit, a operational audit, financial audit, an ethics audit of the commission. Um, and that would include a financial audit of things like USAC, the, the, the corporation that oversees the Universal Service Program, um, and, and things of that nature, um, and to find out exactly what we're dealing with. If you have a major change in management of a corporation, or if you buy a corporation, uh, you're going to do your due diligence. Um, so I think that, that still needs to be done. I know Julius did some of that on his own, but we should do one that's um, uh, more transparent, uh, I think. Now that's somewhat bound by uh, the cost of doing that. Uh, for those who've worked on acquisitions uh, in the private sector, you know, it takes a lot of attorneys and accountants and, and other uh, consultants and experts to, to pull that off. Uh, the FCC is about a $340 million uh, outfit with about 16 to 1,700 employees uh, scattered across the country, so there's a lot, a lot going on. And of course, we administer a, Eight plus billion dollar subsidy program plus a lot of other things. So there's a lot there, um, and in an era when uh, government budgets should be declining, um, whether they are or not, um, you know, they need to think about resources in that regard. So that would tell us a lot, though, if we could uh, look uh, at that, but also look at um, the CFR. So um, I've talked a lot about this before, which is um, reviewing rules to, to get needless rules uh, off the books. Uh, now again, Chairman Janikowski has embarked uh, upon that uh, to a certain degree. Um, uh, by his count, he has more than 200 rules that he says he's taken off the books. We've looked at that in, in my office, um, and probably about 150 of those are sort of what we would classify as bookkeeping, uh, either cross-references that have been erased or um, the court uh, struck down uh, something and it just was left in the rule book, et cetera. Um, so I think we can be more aggressive on that front. Um, you know, the uh, Congress has actually given us a number of tools in this regard. Uh, there's Section 10, uh, forbearance, of course. You've written a lot about Section 10, but also the forgotten sibling of Section 10, right next door, Section 11, um, uh, requiring us uh, every two years to look at uh, 
uh, telecommunications uh, rules um, and uh, determine whether or not they should stay in the books. Uh, there's Section 202H, um, which came out of the 1996 Act, that uh, requires us to look at uh, our media rules um, and deregulate uh, as more competition comes online. It's very explicit, actually. It's a, it has a deregulatory bent to it. There's Section 706, which doesn't provide us with a lot of authority to do anything, but talks about removing <laughs> barriers um, to investment. Um, and it has a deregulatory bent uh, as well, as did the thrust of uh, everything coming out of the 1996 Act. Uh, so uh, these are all tools that we have currently. Um, and I know we'll probably get into a discussion here a little bit later about possible legislative changes. So the caveat I'll say there, especially seeing so many distinguished uh, folks from Capitol Hill here, um, that I don't tell Congress what to do. Congress tells me what to do, but I have been asked many times over the years for ideas, and we've tried to tried to provide them. So there's there's a lot that can be done. Okay, and uh, <coughs> I'm glad you mentioned uh, Section 10 and uh, 11, and and later I want to come back to those and and maybe tease that out more. But just let, let's put that aside for now. And just want to ask you about one of one of the process things you mentioned in that. Uh, letter to Mr. Copps and Mr. Janikowski. Uh, I, 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 from my experience watching the commission and being there a long time ago, I, I thought it was interesting and important. So you said that you'd like to see options, memos, uh, and rulemakings makings given to all the commissioners, I think, at, I think at essentially the same time, or at least early on in a process. That, you know, so that it's not just the chairman that, that has those things early and is shaping the, the, uh, the you know, the rulemaking. And I'm just curious as to whether it ha has that been done. Uh, if not, uh, would you still like to see it done? Tell us about that. Yeah, I think that could be done uh, better. In, in most cases, no, we don't get uh, options memos. Uh, and it would be nice if, if we did. And, and I don't know what the chairman receives. Uh, and I certainly don't want to interfere with each office's uh, independent uh, collaboration and brainstorming. So, you know, there are five of us by statute. We're all independent votes. We each get our own staff. The chairman, of course, is the CEO of the agency and gets you know, access to all 1,600. And Chairman Janikowski has done a very good job of giving us, opening up access to the career substantive experts throughout the agency. So I don't you know, if he's brainstorming with his staff, I don't need to know everything, whoever the chair is, but I don't need to know everything that they're thinking about. Um, but it would be good if <laughs> at a certain point we could get options memos outlining different options. Now, uh, different chairmen uh, are always concerned about leaks, uh, leaks to the press. Uh, and uh, so if there's uh, an idea and an options memo, they may not want that uh, discussed outside the building uh, because it might be put there is a straw man, or who knows, well, there could be some other motivation. But I think it actually would really help uh, with collaboration if we could get to get those. Uh, just you know, it, it really helps stimulate thought and uh, get to hear what uh, the career experts that we have at the agency are, are suggesting, and from across the spectrum of ideas. Right. Now, uh, the House passed a uh, uh, process reform bill uh, several months ago. I get the exact name, but it, it was basically about uh, some of the things, types of things we're talking about, process reforms. But one of the things in the bill, one of the requirements would be for the commission to undertake uh, in each rulemaking, uh, I guess what I would call a more formal or more structured cost-benefit analysis uh, as other agencies are, are re required to do. So without you know, necessarily getting into particular <laughs> rules, although you want to by example, just uh, based on your experience now, you know, uh, how many years has it been? Five? A little over six. So, over six. Uh, is, uh, would that be a good thing? Some, you know, some people that oppose it say it's, it's, it's too much of a, a burden to do these things and it's gonna inhibit the, the rule makings. What's your view on, on cost-benefit analysis? Yeah, I've called for a couple of years now, several years now, for uh, cost-benefit analyses to be incorporated in, uh, before we embark upon a, a rule making. Um, and bona fide economic analyses as well, uh, market analyses of, uh, uh, of the rules we might be uh, proposing, or the, the industries we might be regulating. So um, I think it's absolutely necessary. 
every mm -hmm. rule has a cost. You know, sometimes we're mandated by Congress or maybe a court to have a rule. Um, uh, and sometimes the commission comes up with rules on its own, for better or for worse. But every rule has a cost. There's no such thing as a cost-free rule. Um, there's also, it's just almost a regulatory law of physics, that there's going to be an unintended consequence. And even the best uh, market analysis or economic mm -hmm. analysis can't uh, predict uh, the unintended uh, unforeseen consequence, because by definition it's unforeseen. But uh, we need to be thinking about what these sort of perverse uh, effects are of proposed rules before we embark down, down those trails. I think it's absolutely necessary, and I would support legislation, and, and I've said this publicly before as well, that uh, uh, that, that really should be more the, more the rule uh, than the exception. Okay, now, uh, I'm not going to go back. I, I didn't have any pulled out that transcript from the earlier session. I'm not going to uh, do. I'm, I'm not going to do that. But I think to set the stage to talk more substantively about regulation and cost, just what you're talking about. So I'm, I just want to quote from from what you said when I asked you about your regulatory philosophy back uh, back in February of 2011. Uh, you said, quote, you look at the facts of each situation, you follow the laws as to what you actually en are enabled to do, what you're empowered to do as an agency, but look for concentrations of market power and abuses of that power. And if you need a remedy to fix it, make it narrowly tailored, hopefully make it sunset, and go from there. I assume that's still a fair statement of your philosophy in terms of how you approach your job? Absolutely, and, and I would add to that, which I was probably thinking at the time, but didn't uh, uh, come out, that when you're looking at uh, concentrations of market power and abuse of that power, you have to look at whether that's resulting in consumer harm. And I, I think that's got to be a question that's asked in every, every proceeding. Okay. Now, uh, I understand, and you, of, as you often point this out, I think maybe even more than your fellow commissioners, that uh, on 95 percent of the items before the commission or something like that, that you all agree uh, on those, those items, and uh, I appreciate that. Uh, but it's true that on five per the 5 percent of them that you don't agree, agree on, uh, that includes some pretty important matters like net neutrality or data roaming mandates or, or uh, program carriage or program access regulations, media ownership rules. I mean, these are some pretty important matters. And for you, when there's a disagreement, I, I think this is uh, an accurate statement, that it's, it's usually because it's a case of over-regulation or unnecessary regulation rather than uh, the fact that you think there's too little regulation. That, that's correct, is, is it not? Absolutely. Again, sometimes Congress tells us we have to do something so we you know, try to be faithful to it, but if we're embarking on, on new ground, uh, the case has to be made to me that there is an actual need, a demonstrated need for a rule. And then again, like I said before, it has to be narrowly tailored and preferably sunsetted. Right. So that that leads me to, uh, <coughs> I think, this important uh, part of the discussion. Um, the <coughs> and I think it's uh, really a foundational thing for some of what we've already talked about, but much of what the panel's going to talk about and that we may uh, talk about that follows. Uh, we often say, I know I say it, and I think you say it as well, uh, I know we believe it at the Free State Foundation, that uh, unnecessary regulation and over-regulation. Now, put aside, I, we both agree there's sometimes you need regulation, justified in some cases, but when there's over-regulation, undo regulation, uh, that that negatively impacts uh, investment, uh, innovation, uh, and I think he, even President Obama back in that Wall Street Journal op-ed, uh, you know, a couple years ago, he, he agreed that that was uh, true. Uh, but just explain, uh, because I think it would be very useful, explain why that's true, that that this regulation impedes investment and, and innovation. You know, why is that? Right, and I think Congress contemplated this with the last major comprehensive rewrite of the Act uh, uh, in 1996 with Section 706. It talks about 
removing uh, barriers to investment. It, it actually uses the word investment. So Congress has contemplated this a bit. Um, you can also read that into Section 202H and, and other places too. Uh, but it, certainly in the absence of market failure, if you've got regulation, um, in a way you're politicizing that uh, part of the marketplace that you're trying to regulate. So here we are, five of us. I, I love my colleagues, but uh, you have five unelected Washington bureaucrats uh, overseeing perhaps about one-sixth of the U.S. economy having an indirect effect on the rest of the economy because the rest of the economy rides on the rails of the internet and telecom and communications. Um, and <clears throat> it takes three votes. So in the instance of net neutrality, that's, this is an easy one, you know, low-hanging fruit, but uh, what is reasonable network management? Reasonable network management is whatever three unelected bureaucrats say it is. Um, and none of us has an engineering degree. Right? And a lot of these are business and engineering decisions. Um, so you, you start to politicize these types of decisions. And that means from every two-year election cycle or every four-year election cycle, um, investors, market players, aren't quite sure what the rules <coughs> are going to be. Uh, and that creates uh, uncertainty. Um, so they have to start adjusting or tailoring business plans to these two or four year cycles. Um, and that creates confusion and I think actually inhibits investment and risk taking. But <coughs> would, would you say, are you, I, I know about 30 years ago, uh, Richard Posner, the, who's now the judge of course, but uh, was then I think uh, writing in his law, with his law and economics had on, he wrote this article, Regulation is Taxation, and basically. And, I mean, apart from the certainty part, which I get, I understand that makes it hard to decide whether to invest, but, you know, suppose the current chair of the FCC assured everyone, and it was, Congress said, we agree, we're going to put this regulation in place for the next 50 years, and this is what it's going to be, but it was too, it was unnecessary <laughs> regulation, it was too much. I mean, does that, uh, I mean, how does that affect really the, uh, investment decisions and, you know, the, uh, the decisions that business people make if it's unnecessary regulation? Well, it's just an added burden, uh, if nothing else. I mean, Posner is correct in that regulations are like taxes. Uh, they do impose costs, and those costs ultimately are uh, borne by consumers, either through higher prices and or through not getting an innovation. Uh, that they otherwise would have received uh, through uh, endeavors in the marketplace. And, and that's what you can't measure. You can't measure what didn't happen, really, as the result of a regulation. Uh, for instance, you know, back to net neutrality. So if you look at USTA's uh, CapEx uh, mm -hmm. figures for telecom, in 2010, it was $66 billion. Uh, in 2011, it was $66 billion. Now, uh, I would love for someone in the room, I see a lot, a lot of economists, uh, a lot of PhDs after names here, uh, to do uh, uh, some sort of study, if it's even possible, I don't know if the data exists, is why was that CapEx frozen? Uh, was it due to the December 21st, 2010 net neutrality order or not? Uh, we saw CapEx actually go up during the economic downturn of 08, 09, uh, but stall out between 2010 and 2011. We're not done with 2012, so we don't know what that is. But 2010, 2011, certainly interest rates were cheap. Uh, lots of liquidity in markets, um, so that's probably not it. So what what is it? I mean, the, another thing that should have been driving that is uh, the so-called spectrum crunch. Uh, that should be driving more capex for the construction of towers and, and et cetera. Um, so why did it flatten out? Our population is growing, uh, communications usage is increasing. Uh, so why did capex flatten out? We don't know, uh, and we may not know. It's hard to measure what didn't happen as a result of a regulation. Um, and maybe it takes sort of uh, you know, anecdotal evidence, taking interviews from CFOs and such of corporations, I don't know. But, um, but that's the, 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 the problem sometimes, the challenge with, with regulations. Sometimes, as you said, which are of course needed or are mandated. But uh, when it's unnecessary, um, that is part of the complication, how we can complicate the marketplace uh, uh, to the detriment of consumers ultimately. Okay. Um, now, I just want to remind people when we get, uh, I'm going to keep uh, talking with uh, Commissioner McDowell uh, for several more minutes here, but then we're, then I'm, we're going to take questions. Uh, so if you have questions, we're going to have an opportunity for you to ask uh, a few. And uh, as I said, if you have a, a brilliant idea, you could 
maybe even do that briefly. Uh, and I'm going to be the judge of what's briefly or not when we get to that point. Uh, but uh, now I want to just talk about a, a few, few more specific areas to sort of set the stage. Uh, you, and you mentioned forbearance authority, uh, which I appreciate because, as you said, I've actually written a lot about forbearance authority. And, here, and I've cited you. And, and here's, and I appreciate that. Uh, now here, here's the thing. I, I th number one, that's a very uncommon. Uh, provision to find in, in a regulatory statute, this authority to, to not enforce a, a regulation or s statute. I've, I've said for many years, I think it's virtually unprecedented. And no one comes back at me and says, no, here's, here's forbearance authority. But uh, I, I think, so I think the commission is uh, really underutilized uh, this authority. And frankly, it's not just, uh, in my view, the current, uh, not just the current uh, FCC ad administration. And so what I'm interested in and what I'd like you to talk to and, and uh, uh, think about is, is whether uh, there are changes in the way the Commission carries out this forbearance process uh, that would lead, uh, lead to the grant of more regulatory relief, because that's what the that's what the provision is intended to do when, when it's appropriate and, and justified. And I'm, I'm particularly interested in, in your view as to whether in light of, you know, I understand there's a statute, I appreciate that, and the statute has certain criteria. One of them is in the public interest. Another one is our consumers protect, consumers must be protected. So I understand that. But these, these are terms, you know, they're not like, uh, are all consumers 35 years old, they're, they have a certain amount of discretion inherent in them. So my question to you, Commissioner McDowell, is could the, can the Commission reorient the way it, look, it, it, it looks at forbearance petition, petitions so that it establishes some form of, uh, say, rebuttable evidentiary uh, presumptions uh, or some type of evidentiary presumption that would operate towards the grant of regulatory relief, at least in those situations where there's not convincing evidence to the contrary. Uh, how can you change the process? So uh, certainly there is the language, plain language of the statute, and we have to follow that. Um, and uh, one of the things we can do uh, is more sua sponte uh, forbearance. So uh, take the initiative on our own. Uh, to, uh, to try to uh, erase some of the rules or trim back some of the rules in the rule books. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I like your idea, and I've cited it before, about we should be looking at uh, regulation uh, from a different perspective, which is it should be justified. You have to justify the regulation. It, it, that's why I like the idea of sunsetting. It would force the commission to re-examine uh, rules every few years. Um, and see if they're, they're really needed. You know, it's a, it's a really dynamic marketplace, and not to sound uh, too corny or trite, but I, I, I mean this uh, uh, sincerely, is I, I more and more look at the marketplace, communications marketplace, through the eyes of my kids. So I have three kids, uh, ages 5, 11, and 13, uh, and they are uh, voracious consumers of communications uh, products. Uh, and um, to them, uh, it doesn't matter uh, whether that content is coming over twisted copper pair or coax or over the air in one way or over the air in another way, or licensed or unlicensed. Um, and uh, as we see this dynamism and all this competition and, and positive and constructive chaos, uh, I, I really do think it is time to re-examine the statutory construct where we have these silos. Uh, okay. where it's one set of rules, if it's Title II, you know, Twisted Copper Pair, Telecom Service or whatever, uh, one set of rules if it's under Title III one way, another set of rules if it's Title III another way, uh, another set of rules if it's over coaxial cable, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that really is early 20th century thinking or maybe even late 19th century thinking. Uh, and we, we've got to, uh, to distance ourselves from that. And we need more regulatory flexibility. So. What I said in early 2011 uh, still holds true today. I would, I would hope any discussion regarding a new statute would focus, uh, would start uh, with uh, looking at concentrations of market power, abuse of that power, and is there resulting harm to, to consumers? Um, and that, that's uh, really, I think, should be all wrapped up in uh, what are definitions of the, of the public interest. 
um, because the marketplace is moving so very quickly. Uh, regulators uh, really can't keep up with the marketplace and shouldn't unless there's marketplace failure that results in harm to consumers. Okay, well, I, I like the way you stated that. So just, uh, of course, we're going to produce another transcript here, so this will be useful to uh, I'm giving to my people. deposition, I guess. Uh, <laughs> so, but, uh, and I, I just want to make, see whether I understand, because you talked about if there's a new statute that uh, a fundamental principle uh, I guess guiding the statute should be uh, that uh, the FCC's regulatory activity is tied uh, to uh, uh, market power and uh, also consumer harm. I, I think you put it that way. And, and then you talked about that being in the public interest. But so, but just to be clear, what I want to know, because I think a lot of the problems with the current regime, you know, stem from the fact that. The public interest standard, there's actually a hundred different times in the Communications Act that it's there. So I want to see whether you agree with this or disagree. When the Congress gets around to rewriting it, would, would you recommend, and I understand you're not going to be rewriting, would you recommend that they uh, just substitute those uh, uh, criteria that you just identified for the public interest uh, standard and, and not leave that type of vague, indeterminate standard in the, in the act. Next well, time. So, and uh, having that standard uh, can work well sometimes and not work well other times. There are those who think that because it's, now I had my law clerks count, how many times is public interest actually mentioned? 130? 130. 130, okay. Uh, and does that include the middle class tax relief act? Is that the two? That's 132, including that one. Okay. So, there we have a fresh accurate count for you. So, uh, it's codified 132 times. It's by our count, anyway. Hope your hope your research is good. No pressure. Um, <laughs> just did that this morning. We, but do, we so, do have a transcript. Now. So what does it? That's right. Well, I'm caveating it. Uh, so uh, so what does it mean? Uh, it's in the context of each section and subsection uh, of the statute. Um, and again, it, what does it mean? It means whatever a majority of the uh, elected bureaucrats we call FCC commissioners says it means. Well, that's not a good thing. Way to run a government is. Right, I mean, so more direction from Congress would be very helpful. Right. Okay, now just on the forbearance, before I leave that to tie it down, I, I think you probably agree with this, but you're not bashful. With the, the current forbearance standard, uh, uh, I mean, the authority applies just to uh, telecom carriers or what is that way. And I mean, my view is when Congress gets around to rewriting the act that, and uh, assuming it still has uh, forbearance authority along with other things that we've talked about, that that should apply to essentially any regulated entity of the commi commission, is that, is that right? Absolutely, I think, I think so. And, uh, and maybe even calling for uh, some of these rules to be reviewed, you know, sunsetted and they have to be reenacted if they're needed um, every so often. Okay, now I want to turn to merger reviews and then you and I are just going to do a couple more and then we'll open it up for questions in just a couple of minutes. But, but you know, we, um, merger reviews, I, I think you agree with me and so we'll try and shortcut this a bit, that, that the, and again, the, the, I mean, let's just get it out on the table that the merger reviews and, and license transfers, they take place under the public interest standard. I mean, that's what you're, that's what the commission's applying, you know. And uh, so that leads uh, to the commission uh, imposing what sometimes look like thing, uh, uh, conditions that are extraneous to the actual uh, uh, competitive impact of the merger. There can be differences of opinion, but, but people assert that. And, uh, and, and last minute negotiations and all of those things. And so, you know, people have focused on merger review. Now, here's, but well, there's one part of it that I just want to ask you about. The Department of Justice, of course, is reviewing, or the FTC is reviewing the the mergers uh, at the same time you are, <laughs> generally. And, uh, you know, I know both of us are, and I assume most people in this room are concerned about inefficiency in government and, you know, wastefulness. So my question is this, why, why can't the commission, again, under its public interest standard, which you just said is pretty, pretty indeterminate and broad, could, can the commission, and would you favor the commission just 
saying that we're going to defer to the DOJ uh, to review these mergers for their competitive. We're not giving. We're not looking at whether there's rule compliance and compliance with the act, but for their competitive analysis, we're just going to defer, defer to DOJ. How, do, how does that strike you? Right. So I, I'm not a. Uh, a, a a bureaucrat who's uh, greedy about jurisdiction. Uh, so I think you raise an important point, which is how many layers of review should there be for these transactions? Um, and there should there be more of just an antitrust uh, review? And I think that uh, would be very worthwhile for, for Congress to, to take a look at. Um, and uh, you know, it, it's rare. Uh, I can't remember the last time was you, you, you know, DOJ or FTC had a different opinion from the FCC. On, on one of these, right? So usually the end result is, is the same. Um, and, and keep in mind, though, for most of the transactions at the FCC, they're very routine. There are hundreds of transactions every year, uh, and some of which are approved uh, within 24 hours. It's the high-profile ones we all read about uh, that uh, take time. They tend to be the most, most complex, and they the, tend to be the ones that have uh, competition issues uh, surrounding them. But I think there's a, a good argument to make uh, that perhaps there should be one um, agency that looks at uh, these transactions through the lens of uh, competition law. Uh, and you mentioned the uh, time it takes to perform one of the um, <coughs> reviews at the FCC, which I was, was next on my uh, list. And I, I guess I would just ask, are you, and it, it obviously, the more complex it is, then it takes more time, I, I understand that. Is based on your years at the FCC, or I mean, are there way they, they always seem to take as long as however much time is on that shot clock you guys have? And same thing with forbearance; they take as long as as uh, the statutory limit. I mean, is there anything specific that that you could offer as to how to speed up these things? Because you know the marketplace does move pretty quickly, or is it just inherent in the nature of the bureaucratic process? Um, you know, the commission has this 180-day shot clock, uh, which is observed sometimes more in the breach than uh, in the rule. But um, uh, sometimes they're highly complex. There are a lot of moving pieces. Uh, I've spoken out many times about it taking too long to get these uh, done. I uh, just gave a speech to TIA back in uh, May, I believe, about this. Um, so uh, again, the vast majority of transactions are simple, but for the higher profile, more complex ones, right. it does seem to take too long. Uh, and it is, you know, more and more becoming a, just a cost of doing business that has to be baked into the cost of the deal. And again, those costs are, are uh, then ultimately passed along to consumers. So, uh, you know, perhaps having just one agency review these would help them move more quickly. Let's figure out what a reasonable time frame is for the, these issues to be examined. There are a lot of economic uh, analyses. In the case of a wireless merger, it's a geographic market by geographic market. Uh, some also want to look at national markets, but um, there's, there's a lot that does go on. Uh, so let's figure out what the regional time frame is, and let's try to stick to it. In some cases, it has nothing to do with, really with the complexity of the deal. If you look at uh, the first major uh, transaction I voted on was in July of 06, and that was the Adelphia Comcast Time Warner deal, so Adelphia's assets. Being, and I think, does it, does it have the record for the longest, or is it XM Sirius that has the record for the longest? But anyway. Uh, you had a 2-2 commission from March of 05 until I was sworn in June 1st of 06. Um, and again, most of our issues are not partisan at all, or 95% of the time were unanimous. But uh, this is one of those cases where they were kind of waiting for the third uh, Republican commissioner. Um, and uh, so that was one reason why putting, that Putting that aside, that was uh, sui generis, as we say. Yeah. Uh, but, but uh, I mean, do you get a sense with the uh, current administration, for example, that there's a sense of some urgency to get these things done any quicker because of the marketplace changes, or uh, I mean, do you, there, there's nothing you can think of now that would say if we if we could just do this, then we could speed up the way we review these things. Yeah, there's no one silver bullet, uh, but I think uh, it comes from the top. Uh, if you have a chairman who says you know this will be done in six months, barring some. Uh, major extenuating circumstances, so this will be done Like doing that neutrality or something, taking up a lot of time. Doing yeah, a hobby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, okay, now I, I just want to ask you about video regulation. We haven't, uh, we haven't mentioned that very much, and, and I th you talked about your kids, I think in part you were alluding to the fact, you know, they have all these different devices, they get information 
some of the, of the video and there are, you know, satellite, satellite. We all know the litany satellites, cable, blah, 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 internet, video. Uh, so that, you know, to someone like myself who's been around for a long time and remembers, you know, the three television networks dominating, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible. And uh, Adam Thier here has written a lot about media abundance. But in, in, so you've, you found yourself, I think, uh, uh, disagreeing with, with the majority at times on, the, uh, uh, on, on some of the, the video regs and whether they were still justified. I think that includes media ownership restrictions that are still in place. Some of these put in place even before the Cable Act, right, back, back three decades ago or whatever. And, and, and here's sort of the way I want to frame it. You can, and the other thing you've done, I think, quite eloquently is, is talk about the First Amendment you know, implications. Some people uh, talk about these things and vote on them. And right, it seems to me without an appreciation of the, there's usually a First Amendment interest here at stake, and, and you've recognized it. How, what do you say, I mean, what, what's, what's wrong with this picture in terms of why the uh, commission doesn't seem to appreciate uh, the fact that the marketplace has changed so much and they need to get rid of some of these things? You know, I can't explain the, the motivations or uh, philosophies of my colleagues, uh, but uh, I do think we, in a lot of ways, need to start from scratch. I, I do think we need to uh, understand that there are producers of content and they want to push their content out over multiple platforms. Uh, so when it comes to things like uh, the newspaper broadcast cross ownership ban, that uh, was adopted in 1975, and as I've said before, I think it's as outdated as the polyester leisure suits and disco music of its birth year. Uh, it, it, you know, uh, you can, uh, if you're a broadcaster, you can push your content out over radio, TV, you can push it out uh, over the internet, certainly, uh, billboards, uh, but somehow if you print it on a piece of paper daily, that all of a sudden becomes a threat to democracy. Um, in the meantime, there are a number of markets where we have uh, waivers or, or grandfathered exceptions of, uh, of the cross ownership pool. Uh, and uh, is, you know, my question is, is there less democracy in those markets as a result of that? Uh, I don't think so. And then, you know, I, so I talk about this uh, perhaps more than most, and then some folks will say, you know, industry's moved on, uh, you know, newspapers are dying, uh, why do you care? And then my response is, well, exactly. That's why I care. If this is a rule that uh, is completely outdated uh, with the marketplace, then uh, perhaps we need to, to get rid of it. The presumption should be it should be just discarded. Because actually what we're seeing is so from, um, uh, over the past few years, we've seen hundreds of daily uh, newspapers go out of business. I don't want to say it's because of the rule. Uh, there's a market change going on, of course. But uh, with the market being so fragmented, uh, for just not on the, on the consumption side, but on the supply side of the market, uh, that's, that's only a good thing, and there's uh, less danger of, of, of competition. Uh, I mean, less danger of concentration, uh, rather, um, so because of competition. So, um, and, and pointing to the, kind of based on what you just said, too, I think this is uh, compelling. Back in 1960, uh, when there were three TV networks uh, and one, essentially one phone company, uh, all of the FCC's regulations neatly fit into 463 pages of the CFR. Today, well, as of about a year ago or so, it's about 3,700 pages, even though we have markets that are more competitive. Um, and some of that is because of congressional mandates, but some of it's not. So uh, I think we need to re-examine that. I think that's very compelling. What that shows is from 1960 uh, until uh, last year, uh, the economy, the, the, the number of pages in the CFR grew by about 800%. And the economy grew by a little over 350 percent. So it's an example of how regulation in this area has really, just by page count, uh, has uh, outpaced economic growth. And I think that's very compelling. And that goes back to what we were talking about earlier, about the relationship between regulation and really uh, the impact on investment. Really, exactly. And the transition to the uh, IP networks and so forth. Yeah, and it's uh, no coincidence that investment dollars are flowing more freely to the least regulated areas. Right. Okay, now, but just, you know, it's interesting because when you're talking about video regulation, you said at one point that 
you know, with everything that's happened, there ought to be a presumption. <laughs> uh, use that word presumption against regulation. So here's what I had written down, really, to ask you. And, and you know, I, I just, you know, I'd like you to respond, but maybe it's something we can all think about in terms of either the commission, how it might change uh, in the future, uh, you know, with, uh, change its orientation, or maybe it would uh, with Congress looking at a new statute as well. But, but I, I said you're often and sometimes a lonely voice, uh, which points out the First Amendment interest at stake with respect to video regs, as I, I just said. And I said, do you think? there's any way that when constitutional rights are implicated again, that the com commission could at least establish a priori rebuttable presumptions against regulation. And, and what I have in mind is not each commissioner in, in his own mind, but, but uh, because I just see and have seen for so long and over the years how the, the, the commission often just seems to see as more, there's been more and more competition, but again, because of those 130 public interest delegations and some of this other language that, that, that it's really a C and whatever three people made us on. So what I've been trying to focus on a bit is the establishing, you know, some type of presumptions in light of everything that's taken in the marketplace. And when you've got constitutional rights at issue, that seems even more important. Do you see, you see, I mean, does that uh, sound like it might have some appeal to you? Sure, absolutely, and I should have said, based, you know, also on the newspaper broadcast cross ownership, I, mean, I, I think there's a First Amendment issue there as well. And of course, this is now under the uh, purview of the Third Circuit as our overseer on all this. But uh, I think, especially in the wake of like Citizens United, that that decision, you have to uh, ask whether uh, a speaker is barred from speaking on all platforms, uh, one of uh, one of many platforms, I should say, uh, is that constitutional? Um, but uh, Sure, we should have uh, presumptions. Uh, we should be assuming uh, and, and, and always working in good faith that our uh, rules are uh, not only supported and called for by the statute, but uh, the Constitution as well. And uh, so uh, I've been frequently uh, applying a, a First Amendment uh, screen to, to what I vote on. Okay, well, I wish you could convince some of your uh, other commissioners to do the same, but I. Uh, I know you try on that. Now, I want to. I'm going to ask you one more question. And by the way, you know, Commissioner McDowell, as you can tell, has answered all of these questions uh, so fluidly, and he didn't know what in the heck I was going to ask, and he certainly doesn't know what in the heck I'm going to ask about this uh, this last one. So, uh, uh, I, you've done an admirable job in that way, but that's just the way we operate. Uh, the and, and, and after that, I'm going to ask. Uh, he certainly doesn't know what questions you may ask, uh, and I'm going to give you a chance in a minute to ask some. But, but you know, just a week ago, there was the uh, uh, Supreme Court granted cert in that case, uh, Arlington Towers, I think it's called. And it, you know, it has to do with the commission's uh, authority to, uh, you know, require certain procedures. Uh, you know, from the states and localities in, in the interest of getting uh, the tower sighted more quickly in, in light of the spectrum issues we have. But putting, putting aside that, the, those issues, the, the issue at Granite Sertal, as you know, was whether the uh, com commission is entitled to Chevron deference. That's, as most of you know, a highly deferential review standard when the commission's decisions are reviewed in court on, on uh, decisions that I guess are characterized at the bounds of its jurisdictional authority. And, um, you know, at least some people said, including myself, that depending on how the court, what the court ultimately does, that that could impact uh, commission orders like net neutrality and some others that seem to be at the bounds of its jurisdictional authority as something that's more clearly within it. But do you have any thoughts on, on, uh, that particular decision and how you would like to see the Supreme Court rule on that and the commission, whether the commission should get Chevron deference and so forth? Well, so the, uh, again, as you uh, described, the underlying order is in essence to try to preempt localities a bit uh, to get uh, cell sites uh, up and running more quickly. Uh, and we think, I think that's a good thing. I supported that order. I think consumers would appreciate that too. 
Uh, so there were two issues before the court. They're saying it's not going to address the merits, but sometimes you never know with the Supreme Court. Um, so you know, on the flip side, uh, indecency has been up there twice uh, recently, and they haven't really reached the First Amendment uh, question on that. They keep bucking it back to us. Um, so uh, you don't know where it's going to end up. It could end up, though, the circuits are split, and that's one of the tests for whether or not cert is uh, going to be granted. Uh, it could be a, a shaving uh, of Chevron. Uh, in terms of how much authority does uh, an independent agency have to determine its own jurisdiction, regardless of the end result. Uh, I've only read the grant of cert, uh, whatever you call it, decision, and it's a page, you know, so there's not much uh, there uh, to reveal what they're thinking, uh, but it's something to watch. And so this is for all of you in the AP section of the class today. Uh, this is, you know, uh, advanced admin law, uh, and I wish I could get CLE credit for this panel, by the way. Maybe you can work on that next time. Being a Virginia attorney, I need 12 hours a year, so. Um, but uh, uh, it's going to be interesting to watch for us admin law geeks, uh, and uh, Solicitor General, of course, takes the lead in arguing before the Supreme Court rather than our Office of General Counsel, but we will certainly, uh, our agency will be part of that. But uh, it could have a lot of collateral effects, I think. Uh, it's, one, it's, a, it's a sleeper issue to watch. Because uh, not only our agency, but uh, other administrative agencies as well. Well, in fact, every I mean, you know, every agency. And, and, and by the way, this issue has been around for uh, you know years or decades in the law reviews. People have written you know law review articles on, on it. Yeah. Got, gotten tenure based on writing those articles. But cured but insomnia. The, uh, <laughs> so it, it it could be very uh, very interesting. What was that joke that caused my wife to laugh? So much? <laughs> Curing insomnia. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> She knows about Chevron. More than, uh, <laughs> well, it's okay, so what I want to do uh, now uh, is uh, open it up uh, for a few questions. And uh, Kathy Baker, who uh, is back in the back and is our events coordinator, and by the way, uh, of course, uh, helps make all this work, let's give her a hand. <laughs> And then she has in hand a microphone, uh, and so I'm going to call on people with uh, questions for Commissioner McDowell, and uh, and you, you wait until you get the mic, and then please keep the questions, and if it turns into a comment, keep it fairly brief, and that way we'll get in, uh, have time for a few more before the panel comes up. So don't do what you do. Dan. <laughs> Dan. Uh, well, uh, just two points. First, I'd like to congratulate the Commissioner. The last time I think you did this, you required two glasses of red wine, so you're on the right track. Uh, <laughs> it's Coke. Coke, Coke. Oh, Coke. Okay. Soda. And th that's what, okay, it looks red from back here, and of course, uh, I don't want to betray any secrets of the maze, but uh, many times Randy will come home and say, honey, is this a Chevron 1 or a Chevron 2 night? So, um, <laughs> the, um, the question I had for you, Commissioner, is you, you said that, uh, uh, and I, I think Randy was getting at a lot of this, which is how can the commission under the current statute, assuming Congress doesn't uh, take up a new statute anytime soon, how does, how do, how does the commission uh, increase uh, uh, preemption and deregulation? And I have often thought that Section 706 uh, gave the commission more authority than the commission has stated in its cases and in its presentations to the court. In other words, when you read that, you say it was clear that Congress said if, if something is happening to slow down broadband deployment and adoption, the Commission needs to, to deal with that. It's a, it's a very deregulatory provision. It talks about deployment. I don't think it talks about adoption, does it? Okay. But the deployment is connected, obviously, to adoption if you don't have any, you know, the two are connected. And the, but the Commission has shied away from using the authority there. And I'm just wondering if that would be one place where the Commission could take another look at its conclusions about it's deregula deregulatory authority because in a lot of these cases. Okay. We, I mean, that's a good question. So, I mean, uh, Section 706, it, as I said at the beginning, in my view, is deregulatory and it's bent. Uh, so, what it requires us to do is to produce a report. Beyond that, it's not clear what it requires us to do other than to remove barriers, with the implication being remove regulatory barriers that might be deterring investment. I think it's that simple. Uh, so I don't think it gives us the authority to impose net neutrality regulations, for instance, or right. data roaming. Uh, both of those issues are before the appellate courts. Um, but I think it's really quite, quite simple. Uh, so we're required to produce a report. That's what's explicit. And then the other bent is remove regulatory barriers. 
that might be a deterrent to investment for deployment of broadband. Uh, and that's if it's not being uh, made available to Americans in a timely fashion. So from the end of 2003, we had 15% of Americans having access to at least one broadband provider. Six years later, a mere six years later, we had 95% of Americans having access to at least one broadband provider. That is a spike like that. So you have to ask yourself, uh, is that not, not, not timely? That's pretty remarkable for a country as big as ours. We're not, you know, Luxembourg. So um, I, I, I think it's that simple. That I'm saying is, but it could be a source of deregulation as opposed to yes. I think it's, it's a deregulatory event. The way that it's been sometimes used as a source of regulation. Correct. I agree with that. Okay. Uh, another question, Scott. Real briefly, what do Please you see? Put a minute. I'm sorry. And just if everyone will say their their name uh, for the transfer affiliation for the transcript. <laughs> Blood type, social security number. O positive. Um, Scott Cleveland, uh, net competition. Uh, real um, briefly, you know, what do you see um, when you look at uh, communications law as the one, two, or three most problematic, outdated, or obsolete parts of the law? Well. I think from a higher altitude is just the siloing uh, of the various titles. Um, so, uh, you know, you could say title two, three, and six then, if I need to do a one, two, three, you know, uh, so two, three, and six. Um, I think we need to, to, to knock those down and rethink them. You know, these were all based on, they had their historic reasons. Uh, monopoly phone service, created title two, radio service, they weren't contemplating uh, initially uh, uh, cellular, uh, mobile wireless. So uh, radio service uh, inspired uh, Title III, uh, and then cable TV service inspired Title VI, and all very different reasons and different technologies and business plans and market situations. So uh, my one, two, three would be all of them at number one, uh, really uh, fundamentally rethinking Titles uh, two, three, and six, and probably some others that I'm missing. Okay. Uh Jerry Udwin. After all the time you spent thinking about this, Jerry Udwin with the Udwin Group, all the time you spent thinking about this, Commissioner, uh, what needs to happen to move Congress on this? Some calamitous embarrassment for the Commission at needing rules changed or some political technique that isn't employed? We tried, even in the last couple of years, to reform, if you will, the Sunshine Act to allow three commissioners to get together under certain protective provisions, and that couldn't move, even though it seemed to have bipartisan support. What's it take to make some of these changes in the act that, as you wisely point out, really need to be addressed and dealt with actually happen? I think we should all start fasting, going to hunger strike. <laughs> No, um, so, uh, you know, it took about 10 years to pass the 1996 Act. Uh, I think you need the leadership in Congress that's serious about moving legislation. Uh, and if they say it's moving, then you need to have, you know, what happened with the 96 Act, just to have history be our guide, uh, is there had to be kind of something in it for everybody, consumers and different in industry players. Um, and. Uh, some parties might have to give up things uh, in order to gain things. Uh, so it's going to take that kind of comprehensive effort. But I think, uh, I think uh, consumers, uh, consumer groups, uh, as well as uh, industry uh, representatives uh, will uh, come to the table more quickly if they're convinced that Congress is serious about moving legislation, comprehensive legislation, quickly. Um, and. Uh, that's, that's got to be, you know, I don't think we can wait 10 years. I, I don't think we can take as long as we did for the 1996 Act. So I would hope it would move quickly. Commissioner, would it, would it uh, take having all the commissioners agree on certain basics that have to be proposed or at least calling for some change uh, in order for this to happen, even though the commissioners don't like to try to tell Congress what to do? Yeah, well, certainly this commissioner doesn't. I, I you know, I do. I wait for Congress to, to, we report to the directly elected representatives of the American people, and I, you know, I'm a strong believer in that. Uh, so, uh, but when asked to give advice or give observations, I'm, I'm happy to do so. I don't know if uh, five commissioners can agree on uh, the details of, of legislation, um, so I wouldn't wait for that. Uh, it's hard enough for us to agree on, on FCC rules sometimes. So uh, the leadership will have to come from Congress, but uh, we're there to uh, advise and give our opinions. Okay, now we're just going to uh, take one or two more questions, then we're going to move to our panel. And is there 
I, I want to make sure if any of our reporters have questions that I they all give them a, a chance. They probably already <laughs> have a lot of a lot of red meat or whatever. But is that Ted raising his hand? And then. Hi, uh, Ted Gotch with Telecommunications Reports. Hi, Commissioner. Um, you earlier this year had expressed the the uh, the need you said for the FCC to uh, attack contributions reform this year. Your preference, I guess, I'm trying to say. It seems now, obviously, we're in October. In recent weeks, there's sort of been people in the staff saying that's not see, that's not going to happen. I wonder, number one, if you thought that was the case. Number two, what how that negatively, in your mind, affects the market, uh, given that uh, we don't know how, it, when it would be taken up in 2013, but there's obviously a lot of upheaval with an election and such. It may depend on uh, changes there, but it could delay it further. Just wondering your thoughts. Well, I haven't, I have not been told by anybody that it won't happen this year. Um, so uh, I'll ask that question. Maybe you've been told by people, so that's good information. Um, but, uh, you know, we have a contribution factor uh, that has been spiking out of control. This is a tax on consumers. Uh, the pool of revenue from which we draw those funds has been shrinking and will continue to shrink as market trends continue. So something happens to be, ha has to be done. Uh, and uh, I have been a proponent for many years now of uh, at least examining uh, maybe a hybrid or something involving phone numbers, so numbers and uh, telecom revenues. I, I am not in favor of uh, any internet tax or a broadband tax or something that is a, essentially a broadband tax that but might be named something else. Never have been. So when we talk about broadening the base, uh, it's not into that space. Uh, it never has been. Uh, so uh, I would hope we could get moving on it as quickly as possible. I've been, I'd also for years, since 07, since January of 07, I think, called for doing all this at the same time. I wish we had done it uh, when we did distribution reform a year ago this month, uh, but we didn't, so here we are. Okay, uh, got time for one more. I don't see any of the other reporters raising their hands, so uh, I'm going to call on the gentleman back there for a quick question. Make sure you identify yourself. Sure, uh, Joseph Miller from the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. Hello, Commissioner. Um, just a uh, quick question, I'm, and I'm not intending to cast aspersions. I work for a uh, think, think tank that focuses on African Americans and other communities of color. Um, and I just want to get your thoughts on um, how you framed um, having a deregulatory environment after the global financial crisis, because you may, a lot of the American people have lost faith in deregulation. What are your thoughts? What, what are some of the arguments that you think are most persuasive in terms of w why we should continue to pursue uh, deregulation? Well, so uh, in context, if, you know, just to repeat, where there's market failure resulting in consumer harm, you need to look at narrowly tailored regulation. Um, I think there's actually a debate regarding the, the financial meltdown as exactly why that happened. Uh, you can look at the Community Reinvestment Act. Uh, big federal uh, mandate that uh, uh, was, had a noble cause, which was to lend uh, money to people to buy houses under the public policy goal of more affordable housing. Uh, but it also resulted in the perverse uh, unintended consequence of uh, banks lending to people who may not have been credit worthy otherwise. Then you had some of the risk uh, taken out of, uh, of the market with uh, Fannie and Freddie, federal creatures. Um, who then packaged uh, bad loans and securitized them and sold them in secondary markets. So I think that is a credible scenario as well. We hear a lot about market failure. One, one term we have not really used today, and I should underscore, is regulatory failure. Um, that kind of goes back to the beginning of our discussion, but what are the perverse consequences of regulation? So let's not always assume it's the markets that fail. Let's look at why did that happen? Was there some unintended consequence, some perverse consequence that caused market behavior because of, of a law or regulation? Um, so let's look at all that. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a financial services expert by any means, but I, I do think that's worthy of at least a discussion and a debate. So looking at deregulation, um, you know, re regulation can really snuff out innovation. If you look at it in the telecom context, I have on, on the credenza behind my desk my uh, grandmother, Grandmother McDowell's telephone from San Angelo, Texas. Um, and she had this phone until uh, the day she died in 1992. 
and it was uh, a, a black fake light phone uh, from the 1950s uh, that literally probably could withstand a nuclear bomb, you know, dropping. Um, and it's very rock solid, but it wasn't terribly innovative. Um, and uh, that's what she had. That's what the Monopoly phone company gave her. That's what the Monopoly gave her. There were technologies that could have been brought to marketplace long before, but you had a regulated monopoly uh, when you didn't necessarily need to have one. So uh, again, that kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier. You never know what you're not getting due to the regulation. So the product or service that doesn't come to market, you never hear about. So you don't know what you're not getting. But if you look at what's been exploding, what the parts of the marketplace that have been exploding in the past, let's say 10 years especially, 10 or 20 years, it's been in the least regulated areas. So whether it's in the internet space, uh, both in terms of information services, but also applications and content, uh, those, those seg market segments are not terribly um, regulated. And by the way, are, are tr terrific entrepreneurial uh, uh, ground for everybody, uh, including women and minorities. Uh, this was part of my uh, speech, by the way, before National Association of Black <coughs> Broadcasters last month when they gave me an award. Um, so I think uh, there are tremendous opportunities in the unregulated space uh, because sometimes in a competitive market you can have lower barriers to entry. So let's promote abundance and competition rather than regulation and the uh, rationing that, does, that comes uh, along with regulation. Okay, well what we want to do now uh, is I, I'm going to ask the uh, panelists to uh, come up and while they're doing that, if they could please come up and let's give uh, Commissioner McDowell a really good round of applause.